right. So if you open up to this page, this is a map of the island. And as we read, we might refer back to it. So they'll refer to like the houses on the island. So I'm talking about Claremont and Redgate, Cuddle Down and Woodmere. Let's just see you have like a, a picture. Um, and then they have a Sinclair family tree. We'll also make a family tree, but we'll make it like really big and like make like the connections between the characters and because uh, that helps you understand because we have basically we have a set of grandparents and then their three daughters and then all of the daughter's children. So it does get a little. Um, it's a lot. Yep, it's a really new book. Okay, so we'll start in part one. There are, I think, five parts. Um, no, there's chapters within it. There's technically like 83 chapters, but they're really short, a lot of them. Yeah, there's five parts. So we're going to start with part one, welcome. Chapter one, welcome to the beautiful Sinclair family. No one is a criminal. No one is an addict. No one is a failure. The Sinclairs are athletic, tall, and handsome. We are old money Democrats. Our smiles are wide, our chin square, and our tennis serves aggressive. It doesn't matter if divorce shreds the muscles of our hearts so that they will hardly beat without a struggle. It doesn't matter if trust fund money is running out, if credit card bills go unpaid on the kitchen counter. It doesn't matter if there's a cluster of pill bottles on the bedside table. It doesn't matter if one of us is desperately, desperately in love. So much in love that equally desperate measures must be taken. We are the Sinclairs. No one is needy. No one is wrong. We live, at least in the summertime, on a private island off the coast of Massachusetts. Perhaps that's all you need to know. Chapter 2. My full name is Cadence Sinclair Eastman. I live in Burlington, Vermont with Mommy and the three dogs. I'm nearly 18. I own a well-used library card and not much else, though it is true that I live in a grand house full of expensive, useless objects. I used to be blonde, but now my hair is black. I used to be strong, but now I am weak. I used to be pretty, but now I look sick. It's true, I suffer migraines since my accident. It is true, I do not suffer fools. I like a twist of meaning, you see. Suffer migraines, do not suffer fools. The word means almost the same as it did in the previous sentence, but not quite. Suffer. You could say it means endure, but that's not exactly right. My story starts before the accident. June of the summer, I was 15. My father ran off with some woman he loved more than us. Dad was a middling successful professor at a, of military history. Back then I adored him. He wore tweed jackets. He was gaunt. He drank milky tea. He was fond of board games and let me win. Fond of boats and taught me to kayak. Fond of bicycles, books, and art museums. He was never fond of dogs. And it was a sign of how much he loved my mother that he let our golden retriever sleep on the sofas and walked them three miles every morning. He was never fond of my grandparents either. And it was a sign of how much he loved both me and mommy that he spent every summer in, Wid in the Widmere house on Beechwood Island, writing articles on wars fought long ago and putting on a smile for the relatives at every meal. That June, summer 15, dad announced he was leaving and departed two days later. He told my mother he wasn't a Sinclair, and he couldn't try to be one any longer. He couldn't smile, couldn't lie, couldn't be part of that beautiful family and those beautiful houses. Couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't. He had hired a moving van already. He rented a house, too. My father put a last suitcase into the back seat of the Mercedes. He was leaving Mommy with only the sab and started the engine. When he pulled out a handgun and shot me in the chest, I was standing on the lawn and fell. The bullet hole opened wide and my heart rolled out of my rib cage and down into the flower bed. Blood gushed rhythm rhythmically from my open wound, then from my eyes, my ears, my mouth. It tasted like salt and failure. The bright red shame of being unloved soaked in the grass of our front house, the bricks of the, bricks of the path and the steps to the porch. My heart spasmed among the peonies like a trout. Mommy snapped. She said, get a hold of myself. Be normal now, she said. Right now, she said, because you are. Because you can be. Don't cause a scene, she told me. Breathe and sit up. I did what she asked. She was all I had left. Mommy and I tilted our square chins high as Dad drove down the hill. 
And then we went indoors and trashed the gifts he had given us, jewelry, clothes, books, anything. In the days that followed, we got rid of the couch and the armchairs my parents had bought together, tossed the wedding china, the silver, and the photographs. We purchased new furniture, hired a decorator, placed an order for Tiffany silverware, spent a day talking through art galleries, walking through art galleries, and bought paintings to cover the empty spaces on the walls. We asked Granddad's lawyers to secure Mommy's assets. Then we packed our bags and went to Beechwood Island. Chapter 3. Penny, Carrie, and Bess are the daughters of Tipper and Harris Sinclair. Harris came into his money at 21 after Harvard and grew a fortune doing business I never bothered to understand. He inherited houses and land. He made intelligent decisions about the stock market. He married Tipper and kept her in the kitchen and the garden. He put her on display in pearls and sailboats, and she seemed to enjoy it. Granddad's only failure was that he never had a son, but no matter. The Sinclair daughters were sunburnt and blessed. Tall, rich, and merry, these girls were like princesses in a fairy tale. They were known throughout Boston, Harvard Yard, and Martha's Vineyard for their cashmere cardigans and grand parties. They were made for legends, made for princes in Ivy League schools, ivory statues, and majestic houses. Granddad and Tipper loved the girls so that they couldn't say whom they loved best. First Carrie, then Penny, then Bess, then Carrie again. There were splashy weddings with salmon and harpists, then bright blonde grandchildren and funny blonde dogs. No one could ever have been prouder of their beautiful American girls than Tipper and Harris were back then. They built three new houses on their craggy private island and gave them each a name. Windmere for Penny, Redgate for Carrie, and Cuddledown for Bess. I am the eldest Sinclair grandchild, heiress to the island, the fortune, and the expectations. Well, probably. Chapter 4. Me, Johnny, Mirren, and Gat. Gat, Mirren, Johnny, and me. The family calls us for the liars, and probably we deserve it. We were all nearly the same age, and we all have birthdays in the fall. Most years on the island, we've been in trouble. Gat started coming to beach with the year we were eight. Summer eight, we called it. Before that, Mir and Johnny and I weren't liars. We were nothing but cousins, and Johnny was a pain because he didn't like playing with girls. Johnny, he is bounce, effort, and snark. Back then, he would hang our Barbies by the necks and shoot us with guns out, made out of Lego. Mirren, she is sugar, curiosity, and rain. Back then, she spent long afternoons with Taft and the twins, splashing in the big beach, while I drew pictures on graph paper and read in the hammock and the Claremont House porch. Then Gat came to spend the summers with us. Aunt Carrie's husband left her when she was pregnant with Johnny's brother, Will. I don't know what happened. The family never speaks of it. By summer eight, Will was a baby and Carrie had taken up with Ed already. This Ed, he was an art dealer and he adored the kids. That was all he, we'd heard about him when Carrie announced that she was bringing him to Beechwood along with Johnny and the baby. They were the last to arrive that summer and most of us were on the dock waiting for the boat to pull in. Granddad lifted me up so I could wave at Johnny, who was wearing an orange life vest and shouting over, shouting over the prow. Granny Tipper stood next to us. She turned away from the boat for a moment, reached into her pocket, and brought out a white peppermint, unwrapped it, and tucked it into my mouth. As she looked back at the boat, Gran's face changed. I squinted to see what she saw. Carrie stepped off with Will on her hip. He was in a baby's yellow life vest. It was really no more then a shock of white blonde hair sticking up over it. As the cheer went up at the sight of him, that vest which we'd all worn as babies, the hair, how wonderful that this little boy we didn't know yet was so obviously a Sinclair. Johnny leapt off, leapt off the boat and threw his own vest on the dock. First thing, he ran up to Mirren and kicked her. Then he kicked me, kicked the twins, walked over to our grandparents and stood up straight. Good to see you, Granny and Granddad. I look forward to a happy summer. Tipper hugged him. Your mother told you to say that, didn't she? Yes, said Johnny, and I'm to say, nice to see you again. Good boy. Can I go now? Tipper kissed his freckled cheek. Go on, then. Ed followed Johnny, having stopped the, to help the staff unload the luggage from the motorboat. He was tall and slim. His skin was very dark. Indian heritage, we'd later learn. He wore black framed glasses and was dressed in dapper city clothes, a linen suit, and a striped shirt. The pants were wrinkled from traveling. Granddad set me down. 
Granny Tipper's mouth made a straight line, then she showed all of her teeth and went forward. You must be Ed. What a lovely surprise. He shook hands. Didn't Carrie tell you we were coming? Of course she did. Ed looked around at our white, white family, turned to Carrie. Where's Gap? They called for him, and he called, climbed from the inside of the boat, taking off his life vest, looking down to undo the buckles. Mother, Dad, said Carrie, we brought Ed's nephew to play with Johnny. This is Gat Patil. Granddad reached out and patted Gat's head. Hello, young man. Hello. His father passed on just this year, explained Carrie. He and Johnny are best friends. It's a big help to Ed's sister if we take him for a few weeks. And Gat, you'll have to you'll get to go to cookouts and go swimming like we talked about, okay? But Gat didn't answer. He was looking at me. His nose was dramatic, his mouth sweet, skin deep brown, hair black and waving, body wired with energy. Gat seemed spring-loaded, like he was searching for something. He was contemplation and enthusiasm, ambition and strong coffee. I could have looked at him forever. Our eyes locked. I turned and ran away. Gat followed. I could hear his feet behind me on the wooden walkways that crossed the island. I kept walking, or er, running. He kept following. Johnny Kate chased Gat and Mirren chased Johnny. The adults remained talking on the dock, circling politely around Ed, cooing over baby Will. The littles did whatever littles do. We four stopped running on the tiny beach down by Cuddledown House. There was a small stretch of sand with high rocks on either side. No one used it much back then. The big beach had softer and less had softer sand and less seaweed. Mirren took off her shoes and the rest of us followed. We tossed stones into the water. We just existed. I wrote our names in the sand. Cadence, Mirren, Johnny, and Gat. Gat, Johnny, Mirren, and Cadence. That was the beginning of us. Johnny begged to have Gat stay longer. He got what he wanted. The next year, he begged him to come for the entire summer. Gat came. Johnny was the first grandson. My grandparents almost never said no to Johnny. Chapter 5. Summer 14, Gat and I look, took a small motorboat alone. It was just after breakfast. Bess made Mirren play tennis with the twins and Taft. Johnny started running that year and was doing loops around the perimeter path. Gat found me in the Claremont kitchen and asked, did I want to take the boat out? Not really. I wanted to go back to bed with a book. Please. Gat almost never said please. Take it out yourself. I can't borrow it, he said. I don't feel right. Of course you can borrow it. Not without one of you. He was being ridiculous. Where do you want to go? I asked. I just want to get off the island. Sometimes I can't stand it here. I couldn't imagine then what it was that he couldn't stand, but I said all right. We motored out to sea in wind jackets and bathing suits. After a bit, Gat cut the engine. We sat eating pistachios and breathing salt air. The sunlight shone in the water. Let's go in, I said. Jack, Gat jumped and I followed. But the water was so much colder than off the beach, it snatched our breath. The sun went beyond a cloud. We laughed, panicky, panicky laughs, and shouted that it was the stupidest idea to get in the water. What had we been thinking? There were sharks off the coast. Everybody knew that. Don't talk about sharks. God! We scrambled and pushed each other, struggling to be the first one up the ladder and at the back of the boat. After a minute, Gat leaned back and let me go first. Not because you're a girl, but because I'm a good person, he said. Thanks, I stuck out my tongue. But when the sharks bite my legs off, promised to write a speech about how awesome I was. Done. Gatwick Matthew Patil made a delicious meal. It seemed hysterically funny to be so cold. We didn't have towels. We huddled together under a fleece blanket we found under the seats, our bare shoulders touching each other, cold feet, one on top of another. This is only so we don't get hypothermia, said Gat. Don't think I find you pretty or anything. I know you don't. You're hogging the blanket. Sorry. A pause. Gat said, I do find you pretty, Katie. I didn't mean that the way it came out. In fact, when did you get so pretty? It's distracting. I look the same as always. You changed over the school year. It's putting me off my game. You have a game? He nodded solemnly. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What is your game? Nothing penetrates my armor, haven't you noticed? That made me laugh. No. Damn, I thought it was working. We changed the subject, talked about bringing the littles to Eggertown to see a movie in the afternoon, about sharks and whether they really ate people, about plants versus zombies. 
We drove back to the island. Not long after that, Gat started lending me his books and finding me at the tiny beach in the early evenings. He'd search me out when I was lying in Windmere Lawn with the Goldens. We started walking together on the path that circles the island, Gat in front and me behind. We'd talk about books or invent imaginary worlds. Sometimes we'd end up walking several times around the beach before we got hungry or bored. Beach roses lined the path, deep pink, and their smell was faint and sweet. One day, I looked at Gat, lying in the Claremont hammock with a book, and he seemed, well, like he was mine, like he was my particular person. I got in the hammock next to him silently. I took a pen out of his hand. He always read with the pen and wrote Gat on his left hand and Cadence on the back of his right. He took the pen from me and wrote Gat on the back of my left and Cadence on the back of my right. I'm not talking about fate. I don't believe in destiny or soulmates or the supernatural. I just mean we understood each other all the way. But we were only 14. I never kissed a boy, though I would kiss a few in the next school year. And somehow we didn't label it love. Chapter 6 Summer 15, I arrived a week later than the others. Dad had left us, and Mommy and I had shopping to do, consulting the decorator and everything. Johnny and Mirren met us at the dock, pink in the cheeks and full of summer plans. They were staging a family tennis tournament and had bookmarked ice cream recipes. We would go sailing, build bonfires. The little swarmed and yelled like always. The ants seemed ch smiled chilly smiles. After the bustle of arrival, everyone went to Claremont for cocktail hour. I went to Redgate looking for Gat. Redgate is much smaller than Claremont, but it still has four bedrooms on top. That's where Johnny Gat and Will lived with Aunt Carrie plus Ed when he was there, which wasn't often. I walked to the kitchen door and looked through the screen. Gat didn't see me at first. He was standing at the counter wearing a worn gray t-shirt and jeans. His shoulders were broader than I remembered. He untied a dried flower from where it hung upside down on a ribbon in the window over the sink. The flower was a beach rose, pink and, most, and loosely constructed, the kind that grows along the beechwood perimeter. Gat, my gat, he picked me a rose from our favorite walking place and had hung it to dry and waited for me to arrive on the island so he could give it to me. I had kissed an unimportant boy or three by now. I had lost my dad. I had come here to this island from the house of tears and falsehood. And I saw Gat, and I saw the rose in his hand, and in that moment, with the sunlight from the window shining on him, the apples on the kitchen counter, the smell of wood and ocean air, I did call it love. It was love, and it hit me so hard, I leaned against the screen door that stood still between us, just to stay vertical. I wanted to touch him like he was a bunny, a kitten, something so special and soft your fingertips can't leave it alone. The universe was good because he was in it. I lived in a hole, I loved the hole in his jeans, and the dirt on his bare feet, and the scab on his elbow, and the scar that laced through one eyebrow. Gat, my gat. As I stood there, staring, he put the rose in an envelope. He searched for a pen, banging drawers open and shut, found one in his own pocket, and wrote. I didn't realize he was writing an address till he pulled out a roll of stamps from the kitchen drawer. Gat stamped the envelope, wrote a return address. It wasn't for me. I left Redgate door before he saw me and ran down to the perimeter. I watched the darkening sky alone. I tore all the roses off a single sad bush and threw them, one after another, into the angry sea. Chapter 7 Johnny told me about the New York girlfriend that evening. Her name was Raquel. Johnny had even met her. He, she, he lives in New York like Gat does, but downtown with Carrie and Ed, while Gat lives uptown with his mom. Johnny and Raquel said Raquel was a modern dancer and wore black clothes. Mirren's brother, Taft, told me Raquel had sent Gat a package of homemade brownies. Liberty and Bra Bonnie told me that Gat had pictures of her on his phone. Gat didn't mention her at all, but he had trouble meeting my eyes. That first night, I cried and, a bit of, and bit my fingers and drank wine I snuck from the Claremont pantry. I spun violently into the sky, raging and, raging and begging stars from the, their moorings, swirling and vomiting. I hit my fist into the wall of the shower. I washed off the shame and anger in cold, cold water. Then I shivered in my bed like an abandoned dog that I was, my skin shaking over my bones. The next morning and every day thereafter, I acted normal. I tilted my square chin high. We sailed and made bonfires. I won the tennis tournament. We made vats of ice cream and lay in the sun. One night, the four of us ate a picnic down at the tiny beach. Steamed clams, potatoes, sweet corn, the staff made it. I didn't know their names. 
Johnny and Mirren carried the food down in the metal roasting pans. We ate around the flames of our bonfire, dripping butter onto the sand. Then Gat made triple-decker s'mores for all of us. I looked at his hands in the firelight, sliding marshmallows onto a long stick. There, where once he'd had our names written, now he had taken to writing the title of books he wanted to read. That night, on the left, being and, on the right, nothingness. I had been writing on my hands, too. A quotation I liked. On the left, live in. On the right, today. Want to know what I'm thinking about? Gat asked. Yes, I said. No, said Johnny. I'm wondering how we can say your granddad owns this island. Not legally, but actually. Please don't get started on the evils of pilgrims, moaned Johnny. No, I'm asking how can we say that the land belongs to anyone? Gat waved at the sand, the ocean, the sky. Mir Mirren shrugged. People buy and sell land all the time. Can't we talk about sex or murder, said Johnny. Gat ignored him. Maybe land shouldn't belong to people at all. Or maybe there should be limits on what they can own. He leaned forward. When I went to India this winter, on that volunteer trip, we were building toilets. Building them because people there in this one village didn't have them. We all know you went to India, said Johnny. You told us like 47 times. Here is something I love about Gat. He is so enthusiastic, so relentlessly interested in the world, that he has trouble imagining the possibility of other people, that other people will be bored by what he's saying. Even when they tell him outright, but also he doesn't like to let us off easy. He wants to make us think, even when we don't feel like thinking. He poked a stick into the embers. I'm saying we should talk about it. Not everyone has private islands. Some people work on them. Some people work in factories. Some don't have work at all. Some don't have food. Stop talking now, said Marin. Stop talking forever, said Johnny. We have a warped view of humanity on Beechwood, Gat said, and I don't think you see it. Shut up, I said. I'll give you more chocolate if you just shut up. And Gat did shut up, but his face contorted. He stood abruptly, picked up a rock from the sand, threw it with all of his force. He pulled off his sweatshirt and kicked off his shoes. Then he walked into the sea in his jeans, angry. I watched the muscles of his shoulders in the moonlight, the spray kicking up as he splashed in. He dove, and I thought, if I don't follow him now, that girl Raquel's got him. If I don't follow him now, he'll go away. From the liars, from the island, from our family, from me. I threw off my sweater and followed Gat into the sea in my dress. I crashed into the water, swimming out to where he lay on his back, his wet hair slicked off his face, showing a thin scar through one eyebrow. I reached for his arm. Gat? He startled, stood in the waist-high sea. Sorry, I whispered. I don't tell you to shut up, Katie, he said. I would never say that to you. I know. He was silent. Please don't shut up, I said. I felt his eyes go over my body in my wet dress. I talk too much, he said. I politicize everything. I like it when you talk, I said, because it was true. When I stopped to listen, I did like it. And that makes me, he paused. Things are messed up in the world, that's all. Yeah, maybe I should, Gat took my hands, turn them over to look at the words written on the back. I should live for today and not be ag agitating all the time. My hands and his wet hands, I shivered. His arms were bare and wet. We used to hold hands all the time, but he hadn't touched me all summer. It's good that you look at the world the way you do, I said. Gat let go of me and leaned back into the water. Johnny wants me to shut up. I'm boring you and Mirren. I looked at his profile. I, he wasn't just Gat. He was contemplation and enthusiasm, ambition and strong coffee. All that was there in the lids of his brown eyes, his smooth skin, his lower lip pushed out, was his. there was coiled energy inside. I'll tell you a secret, I whispered. What? He reached out and I touched his arm again. He didn't pull away. When we say, shut up, Gat, that isn't what we mean at all. No. What we mean is, we love you. You remind us that we're selfish bastards, and you're not one of us. That way. He dropped his eyes, smiled. Is that what you mean, Katie? Yes, I told him, and I let my fingers trail down his floating, outstretched arm. I can't believe you're in that water, Johnny was standing ankle deep in the ocean. His jeans rolled up. It's the Arctic. My toes are freezing off. It's nice once you get in, Gat called back. Seriously? Don't be weak, called D Gat. Be manly and get in the stupid water. Johnny laughed and changed and charged in. Mirren followed. And it was exquisite. The night looming over us, the hum of the ocean, the bark of the gulls. Chapter 8 That night I had trouble sleeping. 
After midnight, he called my name. I looked out the window. Gat was lying on his back in the wooden walkway that leads to Windmere. The golden retrievers were lying near him, all five. Bosch, Grendel, Poppy, Prince Philippe, and Fat Fatma. Their tails slumped gently. The moonlight made them all look blue. Come down, he called. So I did. Mommy's light was out, and the rest of the island was dark. We were alone except for all the dogs. Scoot, I told him. The walkway wasn't wide. When I lay down next to him, our arms touched, mine bare and his in an olive green hunting jacket. We looked at the sky. So many stars, it seemed like a celebration, a grand illicit party. The galaxy was holding after the humans had been put to bed. I was glad Gat didn't try to sound knowledgeable about the constellations or say stupid stuff about wishing on stars, but I didn't know what to make of his silence either. Can I hold your hand, he asked. I put mine in his. The universe is seeming really huge right now, he told me. I needed something to hold on to. I'm here. His thumb rubbed the center of my palm. All my nerves concentrated there, alive to every movement of his skin on mine. I'm not sure I'm a good person, he said after a while. I'm not sure I am either, I said. I'm winging it. Yeah, Gat was silent for a moment. Do you believe in God? Halfway, I tried to think about it seriously. I knew Gat wouldn't settle for a flippant answer. When things are bad, I'll pray or imagine someone watching over me, listening. Like the first few days after my dad left, I thought about God for protection. But for the rest of my time, I'm trudging along in my everyday life. It's not even slightly spiritual. I don't believe anymore, Gat said. That trip to India, the poverty, no God I can imagine would let things like that happen. Then I came home and I started noticing it on the streets in New York. People sick and starving in one of the richest nations in the world. I just, I can't think that anyone's watching over those people, which means no one is watching over me either. That doesn't make you a bad person. My mother believes. She was raised Buddhist, but goes to a Methodist church now. She's not very happy with me. Gat hardly talked about his mother. You can't believe just because she tells you to, I said. No, the question is, how to be a good person if I don't believe anymore? We stared at the sky. The dogs went into Windmere via the dog flap. You're cold, Gat said. Let me give you my jacket. I wasn't cold, but I sat up. He sat up, too, unbuttoned his olive green hunting jacket and shrugged it off. He handed it to me. It was warm from his body, much too wide across his shoulders. His arms were bare now. I wanted to kiss him there while I was wearing his hunting jacket, but I didn't. Maybe he loved Raquel. Those photos on his phone, the dried beach rose in an envelope. Chapter 9. At breakfast the next morning, Mommy asked me to go through Dad's things at, in the Windmere attic and take what I wanted. She would get rid of the rest. Windmere is gabled and angular. Two of the five bedrooms have slanted roofs, and it's the only house in the island with a full attic. There's a big porch and a modern kitchen updated with marble countertops to look like, that look a little out of place. The rooms are airy and filled with dogs. Gat and I climbed up to the attic with glass bottles of iced tea and sat on the floor. The room smelled like wood. A square of light glowed through the window. We'd been in the attic before, so we, also we had never been in the attic before. The books were Dad's vacation reading. All sports memoirs, cozy mysteries, and rock star tell-alls by old people I'd never heard of. Gat wasn't really looking. He was sorting the books by color. A red pile, blue, brown, white, yellow. Don't you want to read anything? I asked. Maybe. How about first base and way beyond? Gat laughed, shook his head, straightened his blue pile. Rock on with my bad self, hero on the dance floor. He was laughing again, then serious. Cadence? What? Shut up. I let myself look at him for a long time. Every curve on his face, and also I had never seen him before. Every curve on his face was familiar, but also I'd never seen him before. Gat smiled, shining, bashful. He got to his knees, kicking over a colorful book, pile of books in the process. He reached out and stroked my hair. I love you, Katie. I mean it. I leaned him in and kissed him. He touched my face, ran his hand down my neck and along my collarbone. The light from the attic window shone down on us. Our kiss was electric and soft and tentative and certain and terrifying and exactly right. I felt the love gush from me and Gat and Gat to me. We were warm and shivering young and ancient, and alive. I was thinking, it's true. We already love each other. We do. Chapter 10. 
Granddad walked in on us. Gat sprang up, stepped awkwardly on the color sort of books that had spilled across the floor. I am interrupting, Granddad said. No, sir. Yes, I most certainly am. Sorry about the dust, I said. Awkward. Penny thought that there might be something I'd like to read. Granddad pulled an old wicker chair to the center of the room and sat down, bending over the books. Gat remained standing. He had to bend his head beneath the attic slanted roof. Watch yourself, young man, said Granddad in a sharp, sudden tone. Pardon me? Your head. You'll get hurt. You're right, said Gat. You're right. I could get hurt. So watch yourself, Granddad repeated. Gat turned and went down the stairs without another word. Granddad and I sat in silence for a moment. He likes to read, I said eventually. I thought he might want some of Dad's books. You're very dear to me, Katie, said Granddad, patting me on the shoulder. My first grandchild. I love you too, Granddad. Remember how I took you to a baseball game? You were only four. Sure. You never had a Cracker Jack, said Granddad. I know. You bought two boxes. I, d I had to put you on my lap so you could see. You remember that, Katie? I did. Tell me. I knew the kind of gr answer Granddad wanted me to give. It was a, a request he made quite often. He loved retelling key mo moments of the Sinclair family history, enlarging their importance. He was asking, always asking about something, what something meant to you, and you were supposed to come back with details, images, maybe a lesson you learned. Usually I adored telling these stories and hearing them told. The legendary Sinclairs, what fun we had, how beautiful we were. But that day, I didn't want to. It was your first baseball game, Granddad prompted. After, I bought you a red plastic bat. You practiced your swing on the lawn of the Boston house. Did Granddad know what he'd interrupted? Would he care if he did? Would I see, when would I see Gat again? Would he break up with Raquel? What would happen between us? You wanted to make Cracker Jack at home, Granddad went on, though he knew I knew the story. And Penny helped you make it, and you cried that there weren't any red and white boxes to put in. Do you remember that? Yes, Granddad, I said, giving in. You went all the way back to the ballpark the same day and bought two more boxes of Cracker Jack. You ate them on the drive home just so you could give me the boxes. I remember. Satisfied, he stood up, and we left the attic together. Granddad was shaky going downstairs, so he put his hand on my shoulder. I found Gat on the perimeter path and ran to where he stood, looking out over the water. The wind was coming, ha coming hard, and my hair flew in my eyes. When I kissed him, his lips were salty. Chapter 11 Granny Tipper died of heart failure eight months before summer 15 on Beechwood. She was a stunning woman, even when she was old. White hair, pink cheeks, tall and angular. She was the one who made Mommy love dogs so much. She was always at least two, always had at least two, and sometimes four golden retrievers when her girls were little, all the way until she died. She was quick to judge and played favorites, but she was also warm. If you got up early on Beechwood, back then when we were small, you could go to Claremont and wake Gran. She'd may have muffin batter sitting in the fridge and would pour it into the tins and let us eat as many warm muffins as you wanted before the rest of the island woke up. She'd take us berry picking and help us make pie or something she called slump that we'd eat that night. One of her charity projects was a benefit party each year from the Farm Institute of Martha's Vineyard. We all used to go. It was outdoors in beautiful white tents. The littles would run around wearing party clothes and no shoes. Johnny, Mirren, and Gat and I snuck glasses of wine and felt giddy and silly. Grand dance with Johnny and my dad and then with Granddad holding the edge of her skirt in one hand. I used to have a photograph of Grand from one of those benefit parties. She wore an evening gown and held a piglet. Summer 15 on Beechwood, Granny Tipper was gone. Claremont felt, felt empty. The house was a three-story gray Victorian. There was a turret up on the roof and a wraparound porch. Inside, it was full of original New Yorker cartoons, family photos, embroidered pillows, small statues, ivory paperweights, taxidermy fish on plaques, Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere were beautiful objects collecting by, collected by Tipper and Granddad. On the lawn was an enormous picnic table, big enough to seat 16, and a ways off from that, a tire swing hangs from a massive maple. Gran used to bustle in the kitchen and plan outings. She made quilts in her craft room. 
and the hum of her sewing machine could be heard throughout the downstairs. She bossed the groundskeepers and her gardening gloves. She bossed the groundkeepers in her gardening gloves and blue jeans. Now the house was quiet. No cookbook left open on the counter, no classical music on the kitchen sound system. But it was still Grant's favorite soap in all of the soap dishes. Those were her plants growing in the kitchen, her wooden spoons, her cloth napkins. One day, when no one else was around, I went to the craft room at the back of the ground floor. I touched Grant's collection of fabrics, shiny and bright buttons, the colored threads. My head and shoulders melted first, followed by my hips and knees. Before long, I was a puddle, soaking into the pretty cotton prints. I drenched the quilt she never finished, rested the metal parts of her sewing machine. I was pure liquid loss. Then, for an hour or two, my grandmother, my grandmother, gone forever, though I could smell her Chanel perfume on the fabrics. Mommy found me. She made me act normal, because I was, because I could. She told me to breathe and sit up, and I did what she asked, again. Mommy was worried about Granddad. He was shaky on his feet with Grand gone, holding on to chairs and tables to keep his balance. He was the head of the family. She didn't want him destabilized. She wanted him to know his children and grandchildren were still around him, strong and merry as ever. It was important, she said. It was kind. It was best. Don't cause distress, she said. Don't remind people of loss. Do you understand, Katie? Silence is a protective coating over the pain. I understood, and I managed to erase Granny Tipper from conversation the same way I had erased my father. Not happily, but thoroughly. At meals with the aunts on the boat with Granddad, even alone with Mommy, I behaved as if those two critical people had never existed. The rest of the Sinclairs did the same. When we were all together, people kept their smiles wide. We had done the same when Bess left Uncle Brody, and the same when Uncle William left Carrie, the same when Gr Grand's dog Peppermill died of cancer. Gat never got it, though. He'd mentioned my father quite a lot, actually. He had found... Dad had found Gat, both a decent chess opponent and a willing audience for his boring stories about military history. So they'd spent some time together. Remember when your father caught that big crab in the bucket, Gat would say? Or to Mommy. Last year, Sam told me there was a fly fishing kit in the boathouse. Do you know where it is? Dinner conversation stopped sharply when he'd mentioned Graham. Once Gat said, I miss the way she'd stand at the foot of the table and serve out dessert, don't you? It was so tipper. Johnny had to start talking loudly about Wimbledon until the dismay faded from our faces. Every time Gat said these things, so casual and truthful, so obvious, oblivious, my veins opened. My wrists split, I bred, bled down my palms, I went lightheaded. I'd stagger from the table or collapse in a quiet, shameful agony, hoping no one in the family would notice, especially not Mommy. Gat almost always saw, though. When blood dripped on my bare feet, poured over the book I was reading, he was kind. He wrapped my wrist in soft white gauze and asked me questions about what happened. He asked about Dad and about Gran, as if talking about something could make it better, as if wounds needed attention. He was a stranger in our family, even after all those years. When I wasn't bleeding and when Mirren and Johnny were snorkeling, or wrangling the littles, or when everyone lay on the couches watching movies in Claremont flat screen, Gat and I hid away. We sat on the tire screen at swing at midnight, our arms and legs wrapped around each other, lips warm against the cool night skin. In the mornings, we'd sneak laughing down to the Claremont basement, which was lined with wine bottles and encyclopedias. There we kissed and marveled at one another's existence, feeling secret and lucky. Some days he wrote notes and left them in small presents under my pillow. Someone wrote in a novel that a novel should never deliver a series of small astonishments. I get the same feeling spending an hour with you. Also, there's a green toothbrush tied in a ribbon. It expresses my feelings inadequately. Better than chocolate being with you last night. Silly me, I thought that nothing was better than chocolate. In a profound symbolic gesture, I'm giving you a bar of massages that I got when we all went to Edgartown. You can eat it, or just sit next to it and feel superior. I didn't write back, but I drew Gat's silly cartoon drawings of the two of us, stick figures waving from in front of the Coliseum, the Eiffel Tower, on top of a mountain, on the back of a dragon. He stuck them up over his bed. He touched me whenever he could, beneath the table at dinner, in the kitchen the moment it was empty, 
covertly, hilariously, behind Granddad's back while he drove the motorboat. I felt no barrier between us. As long as no one was looking, I ran my finger down Gat's cheekbones, down his back. I reached for his hand, pressed my thumb against his wrist, and felt blood gro going through his veins. Chapter 12 One night, late July of summer 15, I went swimming on a tiny beach, alone. Where were Gat, Johnny, and Mirren? I really don't know. We had been playing a lot of Scrabble at Redgate. They were probably there. Or they could have been at Claremont, listening to the ants argue and eating beach plum, eating beach plum jam on water crackers. In any case, I went into the water wearing a camisole, bra, and underwear. Apparently, I walked down to the beach wearing nothing more. I never found, we never found any of my clothes in the sand, no towel either. Why? Again, I really don't know. I must have swum far out. There were big rocks off the shore, craggy and black. They always looked villainous in the dark of the evening. I must have had my face in the water and then lit, lit my, hit my head on one of the rocks. Like I said, I don't know. I remember only this. I plunged down into the ocean, down to the rocky, rocky bottom, and I could see the base of Beechwood Island, and my arms and legs felt numb, but my fingers were cold. Slices of seaweed went past as I fell. Mommy found me on the sand, curled into a ball and half underwater. I was shivering uncontrollably. Adults wrapped me in blankets. They tried to get me warm and cuddle down. They fed me tea and gave me clothes. But when I didn't talk or stop shivering, they brought me to the hospital in Martha's Vineyard, where I stayed for several days as the doctors ran tests. Hypothermia, respiratory problems, and most likely some kind of head injury, though brain scans turned up nothing. Mommy stayed by my side, and I got, got a hotel room. I remember the sad gray faces of Aunt Carrie, Aunt Bess, and Granddad. I remember my lungs felt full of something, long after the do doctors judged them clear. I remember I felt like I'd never be warm again, even when they told me my body temperature was normal. My hands hurt. My feet hurt. Mommy took me home to Vermont to recuperate. I lay in bed in the dark and felt desperately sorry for myself because I was sick, and even more because Gat never called. He didn't write either. Weren't we in love? Weren't we? I wrote to Johnny two or three stupid lovesick emails asking him to find out about Gat. Johnny had the good sense to ignore them. We were Sinclair's after all, and Sinclair's did not believe like I behave like I was behaving. I stopped writing and deleted all emails from my sent mail folder. They were weak and stupid. The bottom line is Gat bailed when I got hurt. The bottom line is that the it was only a summer fling. The bottom line is he might have loved Raquel. We lived too far apart anyway. Our families were too close anyway. I never got an explanation. I just know that he left me. Chapter 13. Welcome to my skull. A truck is rolling over the bones of my neck and head. The vertebrae break, and my brains pop out and ooze. A thousand flashlights shine in my eyes. The world tilts. I throw up. I black out. This happens all the time. It's nothing but an ordinary day. The pain started six weeks after my accident. Nobody was certain whether the two were related, but there was no denying the vomiting and weight loss and general horror. Mommy took me for MRIs and CT scans, needles, machines, more needles, more machines. They tested me for brain tumors, meningitis, you name it. To release the pain, they prescribed this drug and that drug and another drug because the first one didn't work and the second one didn't work either. They gave me prescription after prescription without even knowing what was wrong, just trying to quell this pain. Cadence, the doctor said. Don't take too much. Cadence, the doctor said. Watch for signs of addiction. But still, Cadence, be sure to take your meds. There were so many appointments, I can't even remember them. Eventually, the doctors came through with a diagnosis. Cadence Sinclair Eastman, post-traumatic headaches, also known as PTHA. Migraine headaches caused by traumatic brain injury. I'll be fine, they tell me. I won't die. It'll just hurt a lot.